Greetings, Greater Northwest Area. I am so happy to be back in the area after General Conference. By now, you may be aware of many historic accomplishments of General Conference. You may also be wondering what any or all of it means for us. There's so much to unpack, and we have time to do that. For now, I wish to highlight a few things that will be before us as we prepare for annual conference sessions and life beyond. First, I celebrate the collective will of the General Conference delegates to approve removal of the language that caused so much harm to LGBTQIA siblings and allies. That was the answer to many prayers and a balm for many souls. In the wake of that change that's already in effect, we must take note that those who are not in support of that change may feel vulnerable, left out, or concerned about the future of the church. I understand that. And that's why it's imperative that we ensure that when we say the United Methodist Church is a church for all, that we mean all. So no one is expected and no one will be bullied into doing anything that contradicts their convictions and values. The removal of the prohibitions and harmful language really gets us to a neutral point. No one is being penalized and no one is bound to discriminate. Second, the approval of the revised social principles allows us to have global conversations and perspectives on what matters around the world. We are not to be dominated by U.S.-centric ideas and principles. Our social principles are global in nature and much more inclusive of a broader perspective. Regionalization was a major topic before the delegates. It was approved and regionalization will require ratification of several constitutional amendments. And that process will take some time to complete because all annual conferences around the world must vote on it, and the threshold of two-thirds of the aggregate of all voting is needed to approve constitutional amendments. The delegates approved sacramental rights for deacons. They approved a COMPAS retirement plan and closed the CRSP plan. We approved full communion with the Moravian Church and the Episcopal Church. We did not approve many of the petitions related to voting and membership rights for local pastors. We referred several petitions related to the Office of Bishop and formulas related to budgeting. One matter that will linger with us is the Judicial Council decision pertaining to the authority of the Interjurisdictional Episcopacy Committee. That committee is comprised of members of the five Jurisdictional Episcopacy Committees. That's the group tasked with figuring out how the 32 approved bishops will be distributed and assigned across the United States. The Interjurisdictional Episcopacy Committee proposed no new elections, and the General Conference approved that recommendation. The Western Jurisdiction is allotted five bishops. Two of the current active bishops will retire in August, and the work between now and the Jurisdictional Conference in July will involve a process to determine which bishops from other jurisdictions are willing to serve in the West. The bishop must agree, the sending jurisdiction must agree, the receiving jurisdiction must agree. There are many unanswered questions regarding how the five Western Jurisdiction Episcopal areas will be assigned. But all in all, the spirit of General Conference was prayerful and calm. There were tears shed for many reasons. Some celebrated the election of the first African-American woman to serve as president of the Council of Bishops. We elected our very own Lori Day of the Oregon-Idaho Conference as a member of Judicial Council. Our delegates were active participants every day. They worked in close collaboration with the other delegations from the West and beyond. They prayed together and took care of one another. I am grateful for all the work that went into making General Conference work for the good of the whole. It was not perfect but I can see how it is moving us toward perfection. I'm grateful for all the legislation that was considered, but friends, legislation is not the work. 
our work begins now. Our work begins with us bending our knees in prayer, calling out to God and leaning into one another. Our work begins by making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world through vital and relevant worship, active discipleship formation, and direct engagement in our ministry context. We must pay attention to those outside the church. Truth is, we've given 52 years to our internal strife and struggles. Might we give the next 52 weeks to matters beyond ourselves? We can work to make the United Methodist Church a safe and welcoming place for all God's beloved. We can invest in ministry that matters so that health and housing are priorities for all. We can consider what it means to serve beyond or outside our context. We can lift up the ministry of laity and affirm that all are called to serve. We can continue the work of eliminating racism and obstacles upheld by privilege. We can be about telling the story of Jesus and his radical love. We can live the gospel without dehumanizing and discriminating against one another or defacing God's creation. We can be great in the greater Northwest. We can and we will. All the best to you as you serve and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world.